Well, good evening, folks. It's time to begin our Sunday evening class. Uh, today, we are going to be studying the Hasmonean period from 167 B.C. until the advent of Rome and its control of Judea in 63 B.C. So we have quite a lot of material to cover. This is the period of time that some of us may be more familiar with as the Maccabean period. That is the reign of the Maccabees. When we left off last week, <coughs> pardon me, when we left off last week, we left off in about 167 or 168 BC as the madman Antiochus IV, the Seleucid ruler who had banned all parts of the Jewish religion, defiling the temple by offering a pig upon the altar. Now, this heinous action stirred up zealous Jews to begin a revolt against them really since the point that he had began his decree outlawing Judaism or at least the practices of Judaism uh, that began the laying down of roots for those who were zealous for the law uh, that led to this great revolt a war which didn't last very long at least as far as the fighting part went uh, but was one that was extremely monumental in preparing the way for what would ultimately lead to uh, Rome taking power in 63 BC and preparing uh, the world for the advent of Christ as he came into the world some 60 years later or so and how uh, the world was, as I said this morning in the lesson, ready for him in a way uh, that he, it would not have been any time prior or perhaps even now. In God's time, things were fulfilled the right way and his way. And the more we study this history, especially setting up the world into which Paul wrote his prison epistles, after all, that being our uh, most important uh, focus in this class we must understand that the world was ripe it was prepared like tilled earth for the gospel at no other point of human history was it more prepared than it was at this moment and we are seeing the building blocks of that in studying this history so before we get into any more detail on this period and basically where these names come from we're going to hit some highlights of the different Maccabean leaders uh, that led the people throughout this time some internal strife that happened during that period the advent of the Pharisees we wonder again as I mentioned in the very first lesson of this series some weeks ago where did all of these different sects of the Jews and divisions of the Jews come from? The Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, uh, the Qumranians, those that protected the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found many, many years later and provide so much of the information that we have to use as evidence to the accuracy of our English translations of Scripture. Where did all of these groups of people come from well for the main part they came out of de as developments of this period of time in Judea and so this is very significant for us to study and I hope that we can at least gain those things tonight in studying that understanding why they revolted uh, some detail as to how the revolt went, the succession of the Maccabean leaders, the internal strife which eventually arose over the priesthood which developed into at least one or two of these sects, the Pharisees and the Essenes particularly, and what impact that would have on the life and ministry of Jesus, and ultimately on the life of a young Pharisee, Saul of Tarsus, uh, a dispersion Jew who would later be called Paul, 
his Roman name, his cognum, uh, which was one of the three Roman names that Roman citizens had, which we will talk about in some detail in a later lesson, and how, but how these Jewish influences and the shift in culture during this period of time from 167 to 63 would have an impact on this young man. But before we get into the details of that, I'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Our most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we have this time to study together. Even virtually this evening, we pray that as we study these historical facts, we can see the masterwork in your planning as you are preparing the world for the entrance of the gospel through your son may we take the things that we learn may we allow them to shape the way that we read your scriptures as they have been preserved for us to guide us in this life that we might understand more perfectly the true meaning which you had behind them by inspiration and that we might use that meaning to shape the way that it impacts our lives in our day to day walk with thee father we want to continue to be in prayer for those who were mentioned this morning we want to continue to pray for joanne and her family all the difficulties that they have been going through in recent days and especially those that she mentioned uh, this morning we want to pray for sister nancy's friend um, whom she mentioned with dementia this morning. We pray that you will be with them and their family as they struggle through that period of time. We want to pray for the family of Jess Leal as, he is passed, as they have passed away from this uh, terrible uh, virus which is going around. Father, we pray that there will come a swift end to this as it has been plaguing us for so long now that we might return to our normal lives and return with a renewed zeal to carry your gospel into this community bless us as we study now help us to have open hearts prepared to learn that we might better ourselves through this study i pray in jesus name amen now what we must understand is that although there were many uh, Jews who followed the decrees that Antiochus the fourth put out. There were many, and, and perhaps we don't think about that very often, as little as perhaps we think about this period of history. Perhaps we think about the fact, <coughs> pardon me, my allergies seem to get to me this time of day worse than any other time. Uh, but perhaps we don't think about this very often because we don't focus on this period of history very much. But there were Jews when Antiochus issued these decrees, whether it was for fear or some other reason, simply went along to get along. They followed those decrees uh, which outlawed religion, which outlawed the worship of the one true God in the proper sense. There were some who did, and although they did exist, that does not mean, though, that there was not a violent resistance to them. Absolutely. This period, the Hasmonean period, was shaped by that violence, by that zeal for the law of God and a zeal against Hellenism, the growth of Greek culture. Because one thing that we can see throughout this history that I want us to understand is as much as it set the world on fire from the time that Alexander began his reign as the prophet of Hellenism, as the one who spread Greek culture and Hellenistic thought, throughout his empire as much as it set the world on fire and had a great influence on every area of the empire including Judea though they would deny it if you lived during the first century at the time that Jesus ministered and the time after 
they would deny to a great degree the influence that Hellenism had over them, though it did, especially when it came to uh, government and public works and sport and other things like that that were commonplace in a Greco-Roman society. Though it did set the world on fire, we have to understand that like with many things, even today, as they develop within big cities, they are slower getting to the rural areas. And that is really what uh, eventually was the matchstick which lit the fire under the Maccabean family, the Hasmonean family more accurately because they were uh, descendants of Hashmon, uh, who you may remember in, in Scripture. They, the matchstick that really lit the fire, which started the revolt, was not only Antiochus's heinous actions in the temple, but also the slow reaction of Hellenism as it grew outside of the borders of Jerusalem itself, outside of the borders of the city. Notice what is said about Judah Maccabee, who is probably the most famous of all the Maccabees to us. Anyone who has any idea about who they were has probably heard that name at least once. And we will get into some more details about his life in just a moment. But really, the Maccabean Revolt started with his father, Mattathias, uh, sometime earlier after that when, as Brother Ferguson put it in his book, representatives of the government came to the Judean village of Modin. Now that's M-O-D-I-N. That is the village of the Maccabees outside of Jerusalem. They sought to persuade Mattathias, who was a priest of God in that day and as a leading citizen, to set, to set an example based upon Antiochus' uh, decree by sacrificing to the pagan gods. Now here's what happened. Mattathias not only refused, but also killed a Jew who stepped forward. This would be a Hellenistic sympathizer to, to comply with the royal request. So not only did he refuse to sacrifice to the pagan gods, but when a Jew tried to tried to step forward and reason with him in such a way as to cause him to do this, he stepped forward and killed the Jewish uh, official there who tried to convince him. And in, in addition, he killed one of the king's officers who were part of this government enclave which have come to him as a leading member of society in that place and as a priest of God to try to convince him to turn from this foolish monotheistic religion, Judaism, to follow after the royal decree and to participate in this ungodliness. And so we see clearly his answer. When this happens, obviously because of the power of the government, Mattathias and his sons had to run. They had to find a place to be a stronghold. And so what they did was they fled to the hills outside of Judea and called upon all of those. Basically, they put out a cry to war, calling upon all of those who were zealous for the law, zealous for the law of their fathers, and they rallied them together. They are beginning this revolt by rallying those that were true and faithful to God. And because he was already such an influence over the people, being a priest and a leading citizen, this family quickly became the leadership of this movement, the Hasmonean Revolt. Now, his son Judas, or Judah as we know him more commonly, was given command and given power um, sometime around the death of Mattathias, within a year of when he died, in 166 or 165. So by the time he actually kills this king's official and kills this Jewish sympathizer, and they flee to the hills beginning to rally people, 
he's already an old man and he passes away within a year of this so quickly he bestows command and power leadership to judah one of his five sons who bore the nickname maccabee and that's where that came from their family name was not maccabee it was uh, they were descendants of heshmon and that is where uh, the idea of hasmonean came from they are descendants of heshmon maccabee is a word that was a nickname one thing that we will notice in the differences in society in jewish culture and greco-roman culture is as i mentioned to paul just a few moments ago uh, romans had three names they had their cognum they had their uh, family name and they had their forename uh, the cognum is like your common name uh, which is what we know of Paul. We don't know his family name. We don't know his forename. Saul was not uh, the Hebrew translation of Paul, nor vice versa. Paul is from the Latin Paulus or the Greek pa Paulus. Um, and what uh, that was was his Roman name in roman society let's say in tarsus in public in government in things like that that is what he would be called saul was his jewish name this is the name that he would have been called uh, from a jewish standpoint when he was in jerusalem studying at the feet of gamaliel as he was growing in knowledge becoming a leading member of the pharisees when he reached the point of being a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, that would be the name that he was called. It is the name that we see of him in the early onset of the church as he is the persecutor. But in Roman society, he would have always been called Paul. They are not direct translations of each other. That is a confusing thing to some people because I think because of the similarity to the way they sound in English people just assume that uh, Saul and Paul are the same name just different versions and they're not but as I was saying uh, Jews did not have three names such as Romans did it was not common for that Jews had of course their name and their surname their family where they came from uh, you think of uh, Simon Barjona Simon son of Jonah that would be the way that they were known uh, or they would be given nicknames such as Barnabas who was nicknamed the son of encouragement but this Maccabee which we know them as the Maccabees we have known him as Judah Maccabee was a nickname and it meant the hammerer now what that had to do with him whether that was his occupation or what have you we don't know but that was his nickname and it was uh, a name that was prob uh, properly popper, popularly given to his brothers and their descendants um, and the resistance as a whole but it was not their family name it became popular to call them the Maccabees because as with anything else with a with a sports team or even in our own history with a with a military regiment uh, they give them nicknames from time to time uh, you may remember an old John Wayne movie many many years ago remember the flying tigers uh, that was a nickname given to this group of people who uh, made those flights and, and participated in the war in that way we do that now and this nickname of Judas's is one that eventually took root and became sort of a, a moniker for the whole during this period um, 
And what did they do during this revolt? How did it work out? Well, from their strongholds in the wilderness, Judah and his followers, all that they had gathered who were zealous for the law, that was the whole point of this revolt, was to restore order and restore the law within Jerusalem after this heinous, heinous act from Antiochus, the madman, Epimenes. He wanted to be known as Epiphanes. God manifested. They called him Epimenes, the madman. <coughs> but from their stronghold in the wilderness there, they would lead guerrilla campaigns. We think today that guerrilla warfare is a new thing because for so long in our heritage, you just go back 300 years to the revolution, there was not as much of that sort of thing. It was sort of line up on a battlefield, you shoot or you attack me, and I attack you. And we keep going until the numbers dwindle to such a point, <coughs> excuse me, that someone uh, initiates a defeat here, or a concession, rather. And what they would do instead is something more similarly to what we see today in modern warfare. They led these guerrilla attacks, which included raiding villages and overthrowing pagan altars that had been built in these places, taking children <coughs> who had not been circumcised, Jewish children and those that were older who had not been circumcised during this per period when all of this was outlaw and circumcising them by force again with the intent of doing what reinstating the law to its fullest glory uh, they were killing those that were hellenistic sympathizers the leaders of those who were uh, adv advocating for this uh, jewish um this Jewish uh, destruction to to uh, get rid of that system completely. They were killing them in droves. Um, and they began to do this all over in Judea until ultimately in 165 or 164, Antiochus finally admits defeat and withdraws his ban on the Jewish religion but he left um, the high priest that he had put forth there um, without reinstating the true high priesthood. And so Judah and his followers go about to uh, cleanse the temple, which of course, because of his... Um, heinous act which he had done upon the altar had been made unclean and so this is what we see in that instance here I want to read a long quote um, about the rededication of the temple here from brother Ferguson's book that I added to my notes here because one of the developments out of this is the Jewish celebration that they celebrate even today that we know of as Hanukkah. What is that and where did it come from in that we had not seen it, called that, or, or, or brought forth in any way in the Old Testament? Where did that come from? Well, that came from the rededication of the temple in this moment. I'm going to start here uh, in um, on page 408. If you happen to buy this book as one of the recommended readings when we began this class, it's about the third paragraph down. This is uh, where the tradition of Hanukkah that we know of today and that Jews still celebrate comes from, this rededication of the temple. Uh, finally, in 165 or 164, as we've already mentioned, Antiochus IV withdrew the ban on the Jewish religion, but left Menelaus uh, in the high priesthood and the garrison on the Arca, that is his garrison, the Seleucid garrison there. Nevertheless, Judah's troops moved into Jerusalem and kept the Syrians uh, 
occupied while the temple area was rededicated. The idol altar, the one that uh, Antiochus had sacrificed the pig upon earlier, the idol altar was dumped in an, uncom in an unclean place. Some scholars believe, and Brother Ferguson is one, that that may have been um, the roots of the Valley of Hinnom. We know that in the day of, of Christ, brethren, the Jewish brethren, dumped their red refuse in the Valley of Hinnom, and there was constantly a refuge fire going on there. And as, Jew, as Jesus uh, is describing hell, the place of perdition in his ministry, he uses the word Gehenna, which is a derivative of the Valley of Hinnom and the, con the constant fire that is there. Uh, some scholars believe that this, the Valley of Hinnom, is where they dumped the idol altar of Antiochus IV. And the sacred furniture, the pieces of the temple that we all know well, which had been translated from the tabernacle into the temple, both Solomon's and the rebuilt temple of Nehemiah's day. And the sacred furniture was restored according to a sad note in 1 Maccabees 440. That is an apocryphal book, First and Second Maccabees. They were books written around the time of scripture that are not inspired but some of them have some useful information the books of Maccabees are a pretty accurate history to what happened during that point especially first Maccabees second Maccabees a little less so but a lot of the apocryphal books really don't ring true with what we know to be inspired in scripture and so they must be rejected out and out however the two books of Maccabees Pretty decent histories. Uh, in a passage in 1 Maccabees 440, the altar of the burnt offering that had been defiled was dismantled and the stones deposed in a covenant pl in a convenient place on the temple hill until there should be come a prophet to tell what to do with them. This was one indication of the re realization of this period that prophecy had ceased. Of course, there was no revelation from God during that period. However, that did not mean that God did not have his hand in the inner workings of this, as we will see in just a moment in this quote. Um, this was, uh, a new altar was built according to the directions in the law, and it was set up exactly there point restore the law in its full glory as it should be and so they built this altar as it was according to the law and it was set up by that direction on the 25th day of Kislev what we would know as December 14th 165 or 164 give or take a year depending on your timeline uh, the third anniversary of the profanation of the altar when Antiochus, of course, burned the pig, the daily burnt offering was resumed. In commemoration of this event, a new festival was added to the Jewish religious calendar, Hanukkah, or dedication, as it is known in John 10:22, commonly called the Feast of Lights, we know, uh, the story of the menorah which continually burned throughout that period of time and it is still celebrated today but the roots of it came during this period now in the very next year Antiochus IV dies and uh, Judah laid siege to the Syrian garrison at Jerusalem the Arca that was mentioned there the Syrian regent uh, Lysias led an army southward as he was on the point of crushing Judah's forces news of, of trouble for him in Antioch caused him to stop the attack he confirmed the restoration of the temple service according to the ancient practice but ordered the destruction of the fortifications the Maccabees had, re had erected in the temple area he further deposed Menelaus and nominated Alchemius for the high priesthood however 
This is another key point that we must remember. The Hasmoneans were not content with their achievements in restoring the law as long as this Hellenistic Syrian appointed uh, Alcinous was um, in the high priesthood and holding that office. The Hasidim at first, though, accepted this man in return for his recognition that they represented the correct interpretation of the law. Now, some will say that the roots of the Pharisees come from this Hasidim, or the Hasidim, as it is known. It is possible of that. At first, they were willing to accept this man, as long as he would recognize that their interpretation of the ancestral law was true. Does that sound like the roots of the Pharisees who believe so much in their traditions? Absolutely. Anyway, this continued for a while. Uh, they withdrew their revolt once the narrow religious aims had been accomplished, but Judah continued the struggle. The Hasidim pulled back. As allies to Judah Maccabee, they pulled back for a while because they were willing to accept that. But he continued the struggle, undertaking campaigns for political purposes at this point, bringing groups of Jews from all the outlying regions of Judea. He went into the highways and the byways for their protection and for the strengthening of his position for what point? To restore the high priesthood, or at least some semblance of it. Uh, fresh disturbances, the continued uh, efforts of Judah Maccabees led to them calling out for the Syrians for help, and Judah was killed in an engagement against an overwhelming Syrian force in 160 BC. His brother Jonathan would then take power Uh, and, uh, in command of the people as Judah died but ultimately this uh, would lead to eventually the, re the restoration at least of a semblance of the priesthood in the succession of the Maccabean family now what we know is that at this point the true high priest could only come from the family of Zadok. And that would be a huge point of contention later on. Those who believed in that so fervently were uh, known as the Essenes or the Zadokites. They would retreat to the area known as Qumran where the um, Dead Sea Scrolls would be compiled as far as the scriptures. And that was one division among them. But this appointment of one of Judas's brothers as they continued down the line of succession, as they began to rule during this period of time, would lead to the creation of a lot of these different uh, divisions here. And as we're moving along a little bit more rapidly, let's go about... 20 years into the future. By this point, Jonathan has died, and uh, his other brother, Simon, the last survivor of the five, Simon uh, ruled from 143 to 134 BC. He had a strong Jewish backing and was report, uh, and he supported the cause of uh, Demetrius II against Trapho, and this support that he provided uh, provided some protection for the people at this point, though he held control. Now, about 140 BC is what we want to see in the major shift here for the point of leading to what ultimately caused the uh, beginnings and the roots of the Pharisees here. An assembly of the Jewish people in 140 BC proclaimed this Simon not only as the commander of the army, 
but he was the ethnarch of the nation that way that way he was leader of them as an independent nation and high priest uh, the line of the high priest that last office was confirmed to his family forever until a trustworthy prophet should arise so the point was this is only temporary until a prophet shall arise in this period when there was no prophet in order to um, at least create some structure but ultimately what happened as it does with many families as uh, leadership is passed down in such a way is they become corrupted by this and that's what ultimately led to the establishment of the Pharisees I want to bring this up um, Josephus mentions the Pharisees and brother Ferguson said as an opposition group to the Hasmonean high priesthood in connection with the reign of John Hyrcanus he was the successor and came after Simon uh, in this line and during this period understanding the difference here in what was going on uh, they wanted to return to the proper uh, form of the high priesthood and so they opposed this Hasmonean line um, around <coughs> I think it is Antiquities chapter 13, Antiquities 13, 10, um, and uh, I believe it's paragraph 5 and 6 where this is mentioned. In most translations that you find today, it should be somewhere around 288 in the next 10 pages in there. If you want to look at a copy of Josephus, you can find one online uh, free most of the time to actually read those writings there. Um, but during that period of time we see the development of the Pharisees as an opposition however to John Hyrcanus and his high priestly office however he received support from another group the Sadducees the dominant party in the Sanhedrin that is the high priest in the high court of the Jews at this point so you had two parties already splitting out of this division over what the high priesthood everything else that we see that divides them the belief in the resurrection the belief or lack thereof in the Torah versus the prophets themselves which should you hold to more the Sadducees would hold to the Torah only and, and question the inspiration of the prophets and the other writings whereas the Pharisees would hold to the um, right of the law in its entirety however they would um, make a distinction when it came to their oral tradition holding it as just as important as this law um, now what we need to understand is that the Pharisees power among the people though the Sadducees would keep the political position and eventually become friends of Rome which created more division the, the Pharisees power of the people came to greater and greater fruition as time went on because they carried on this torch of restoration which had been set up by Judah Maccabee and his brothers early on and so that's how they gained so much influence with the people though in the Sanhedrin they became they were the minority party they gained as much power with the people because they were all about restoration of the law and upholding the oral traditions which they to be believed to be just as weighty as the law now the line would continue with several other leaders all the way down to Arcanus the second and Aristobulus the second two of the youngest of the sons uh, of the Heshman dynasty the descendants of Heshman they would be the ones on the throne when the armies of Rome under the general uh, Pompey uh, 
would appear in Syria and ever after having overcome Asia Minor, Armenia, and the last of the Seleucid powers would set their eyes upon Rome, I mean, upon Jerusalem, and he did. And when he conquested the city of Jerusalem itself in 63 B.C. and stepped into the temple itself, walked through the holies of Ho the holy of holies. Now we're going to get into some more detail with that next week as we spend time with uh, the early advent of Rome, how this all was set up, Pompey's entrance into the temple, and we're going to pose a question. What happened with the Ark of the Covenant? The answer is we do not know for sure, but I am going to present some theories in conjunction with that part as we are laying the foundation for the actual society into which Jesus came and into which Paul wrote next week now that we have reached Roman history. We are almost to the end of this historical portion before we get into the text so I'm looking forward to next week. Thank you so much for your attention and I hope this has been helpful to you.